Hey everyone, and welcome back to my Making a Computer and Scrap Mechanic series. Last time, I went over the six basic logic functions in the game and touched on why they'll be useful. In this video, I'll begin using them for data storage. In real life, there are a few main types of memory, but the one I'm going to use most is called SRAM. SRAM, or static RAM, takes about six-ish logic gates per bit. That number varies with the exact implementation and requirements of the memory, but mine will be around that number. The heart of the storage, though, requires only two gates. These two gates can either be both NOR gates or NAND gates, but you can't mix them. While either using NOR or NAND gates works fine, I'm generally more comfortable using two NOR gates for this, so that's what I'll demo in this video. Just as a reminder from last episode, NOR gates only turn on when all of their inputs are off. If any of the inputs are on, the NOR gate will turn off. The main trick of creating data storage lies in connecting the outputs of each of the gates back into the other gate, like this. That's all the connections we need to make. The output of the memory bit we could choose to be either the top or bottom NOR gate's output, but I'll make the top gate the output, and the bottom gate the opposite of the output. You may wonder why I wrote a queue on these output lines, and to an extent, I do too. It's common to use a variable to denote inputs and outputs of a logic circuit, but sometimes there are commonly used variables that are just kinda weird. Outputs are often written as queue, which I've read is to emphasize their quantization, as outputs either need to be a 1, or zero, and cannot be something in between that. Q also looks a lot like an O, but if you just used an O, it might look very similar to a zero, which might be problematic. Personally, I still think O would make a little more sense, but it's the world we live in, and for consistency, I'll also be using a Q to denote outputs. The bottom NOR gate, though, isn't just Q, it's Q with an apostrophe. Now that's right as Q prime, and it just means that it's the opposite of Q. So if Q is a one, Q prime is a zero, and if Q is a zero, Q prime is a one. It's what would happen if we ran Q into an inverter. Moving over to the inputs, we have a free line on both of our NOR gates. We can use any variable we want for these inputs, but with this memory storage system, it's very common to use an S and an R for the two inputs. Which one is S and R is actually really important, so I'll come back and rename the right inputs S and R in a bit, but for now I'll call the two inputs A and B. The SR latch starts off in a random state. Either Q will be on, or Q prime will be on. In a theoretical situation like this, it is truly random which gate will start outputting a 1. In real life, the gates have tiny differences in their construction that make one of them usually turn on first instead of the other, but it's still fairly random. I like to think this is because when we first power on the gate, we haven't given it any data to store yet, so there's no correct state for it to be in. It therefore just randomly selects a state to start in. For this example, we'll just assume that the output starts out off, and the opposite of the output starts out on. We'll start by setting both of the inputs to zeros, which just means that they're starting out off. The inputs for the top NOR gate are a zero and a one, since the signal coming from the bottom NOR gate is a one. This makes the NOR gate turn off, since at least one of its inputs is on. The bottom NOR gate is now receiving one off input from B here, and one off input from the output of the top NOR gate. This makes the NOR gate turn on, since all of its inputs are off. This makes sense as well, since we defined it to be off in the beginning. The important thing to realize is that when both inputs A and B are off, the latch is considered to be in an inactive state and will not store any new values. Things get more interesting if we start messing with the inputs. If I set the bottom input to be on and keep the top input off, now we need to reevaluate the circuit. Looking at the bottom NOR gate, we have one input that's on and another that's off. This means the output of the gate will turn off since at least one of its inputs is on. Moving to the top gate, we have one input that remains off, but the input coming from the output of the other logic gate is now also off. Since both inputs are off, the output of the NOR gate will turn on. Finally, the output of the top gate runs into the bottom gate, but this won't change the output of the bottom gate since we already had at least one input that was on. Now everything is done changing. If we change the bottom input back to being a zero, the bottom NOR gate is inputting a zero and a one, which keeps the gate off, so the state of the latch remains the same. This makes sense, since we discovered that setting both of the inputs to being off puts the latch in an inactive state, making it not change the output. You'll notice now that we've made a circuit that can change the output state by momentarily triggering an input. I mean, maybe it's not that clear. But if I bring in an image from before we set the B input to a 1, the output state was opposite of the one we have now. This is cool, but ideally we could somehow revert back to the initial state as well. That's where the other input line comes in. If we again take a look at our system where the output is on, Let's try turning on input A and leaving B off. Looking at the top gate, it's receiving one on signal and one off signal. So the NOR gate turns off its output. 
Now looking at the bottom gate again, it's receiving an off signal from the other NOR gate and an off signal from input B. This turns the gate on, which finally runs back into the top gate. Even if we remove the input signal, the system remains in this reset state since the top NOR gate has at least one of its inputs on. This is how an SR latch works. Since activating the bottom input turned on or set the output line, and activating the top line turned off or reset the output line, we can call the bottom line the set line and the top line the reset line. For compactness, we could assign them the variables S and R for set and reset. We still aren't quite done yet, as there are three other cases to look at. Right now, we have our output line off or reset. What happens if we try to reset an already reset latch? If we turn on the reset line now, we can see that both lines going into the NOR gate are on. This means the output of the gate should be off, since at least one of the inputs are on. Well, it already is off, so nothing changes. Similarly, if we try to set an already set latch, we send two on signals into the NOR gate, which turns it off. It was already off though, so nothing changes and the latch stays set. Trying to reset an already reset gate, or trying to set an already set gate, does nothing. Finally, you may ask what happens if we try to set and reset the gate at the same time by turning on both the S and R lines. Basically, this is just considered an invalid state since it turns on both the output and the opposite of the output on at the same time, which is basically just useless. I realize that I haven't even tried making this in the game yet, so let's do that now. I'll place down my two NOR gates like this, and now try to set the output of each as an input for the other gate. I can do that with the first gate like this, but the moment I try to run a signal from the second gate to the first gate, both signals disappear. This is just a quirk of the game. The method to delete a signal wire is to drag from the signal end to the source or from the source to the end. This means that trying to run the second signal wire deletes the first one since they have the same source and endpoints, just reversed. This isn't a huge deal, but we need to add another logic gate in. If we use an OR gate in addition to the NOR gates, we could solve our problem. We can run our first signal just like we did before, but now instead of running the second signal directly back into the first, we'll run it into the OR gate and run the output of the OR gate into the first NOR gate. We still have a signal loop, but just with an extra gate thrown in. The OR gate will turn on if any of its inputs are on. Since we only have one input though, if that signal input is on, the gate will turn on, and if it turns off, the gate will turn off. In real life, we call this a buffer, and while it sounds useless to output the same signal you're inputting since you could just instead run the input directly into whatever you need, combining it with some other stuff we'll develop later will make it more useful. Going back to our OR gate in the game though, we're just using it as a workaround for the signal deletion problem. Technically right now we can run two inputs and be complete. I would just do that, but the OR gate creates a tiny imbalance in the system. The signal coming from the first NOR gate gets to pass directly into the second NOR gate, creating only one tick of delay. The signal running into the first gate though passes through this OR gate first, creating two ticks of delay. While this isn't necessarily an issue, just for consistency to make this look nice and symmetrical, I'm going to run the output of the first NOR gate through an OR gate as well, so both gates have two ticks of delay before activating the other gate. I want to emphasize though, this is unnecessary, I'm literally only doing it because I think it looks a little bit nicer. Let's add in some buttons and lights. I'll start by putting down a light and connecting it to the output signal. This will make it easy to see the current state of the output. Also, I'm going to use two push buttons for the input lines. Following our schematic, the bottom signal or this button should be the set signal, which I'll paint green. And this button should be the reset signal, which I'll paint red. Notice also that the output is starting out on. It doesn't matter what it starts out as since we can either just set or reset it to the correct value. But as I said before, when first powered up, SR latches just take on a random state. Let's try it. If I press the set button right now, nothing happens since the output is already set on. If I instead press the reset button, the output turns off. If I press the reset button again, nothing happens since the output is already reset. Finally, if I press the set button, the output turns back on. So we've created a way to store a single bit of memory. That's not amazing, but using more of these latches lets us store more data. If I make three more of these latches, we can store 16 unique output states. These are more usable numbers. Before I finish the video, I want to add in a few more gates to simplify our inputting system. It's a little clunky for having two separate inputs for turning on and off the latch. Ideally, we could have one data signal and a clock signal. When the clock signal turns on, the latch will store whatever value the data bit has. We could start by placing down two AND gates so that their outputs run into the S and R inputs. Now we could place an inverter so that the output is going into one of the inputs of either the two AND gates. Finally, we could set the input of our inverter to be the data signal, which I'll give the variable D. The other AND gate will have one input signal be this new D signal. 
Now we have these two loose inputs on the AND gates that we can connect the clock signal to. I'm going to shorten it to CLK. That's all the wiring. How does it work? Well, let's say that both our data and clock signals are low or off. This means that we can rate a zero in for all instances we see either a D or a CLK. This inverter is the next thing to solve. Since we have a zero as the input, the inverter inverts the input, so it outputs a one. This solves all of the inputs for the two AND gates. Neither of these gates will turn on though. The AND gate needs all of its inputs to be on to turn on. So since the clock signal is off for both gates, they'll both output zeros. Our S and R inputs are zero now, so the latch will not store any new data. If we toggle the clock line, now we have this AND gate turn on, since both the clock and the inverted data signal are now on. This means that the AND gate will reset the latch. If instead we turn on the data bit, now this AND gate will turn on instead of the other one. This AND gate will now turn on the set signal, which turns on the output. This tells us that if the clock signal is active, the output of the latch will store whatever value the data signal is. This data clock storage technique is called the D-type flip-flop. It's going to be the basis of the vast majority of registers and RAM that I make for the computer. I built four of these D-type flip-flops next to each other to create a 4-bit data register. I have the four data toggle switches in front of me here, and I connected all of the clock signals together. Since we want the data values to be written all at the same time to the register, we can just use one synchronized clock instead of four separate clocks. I'll set the number 10 in binary to store here at the switches. Now if I toggle the clock line, that data is stored on the output. I can mess with the inputs all I want, but as long as I don't toggle the clock line again, that data will be stored in the latch forever independent of whatever I'm doing with the inputs. I think I'll end the video here. Next time I'll cover how we can connect a bunch of these D flip-flops together to create addressable RAM. So guys, thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to ask below. Until next time.